Well, hello, everybody. Uh, I am Dr. Hetty Red Dexter, and on behalf of my colleagues, Drs. Brandon Cosley and Jay Dill, we are here uh, to represent social psychology, which truly does have a broad reach. Uh, not to be confused with social work, as some do, our focus of research is on what motivates ordinary people to do what they do in everyday situations. In other words, we study normative or normal behavior. Uh, given that, I started my trajectory, my academic trajectory at the College of William and Mary. You can drop down. Go to the next one, yes. No, 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 just the first one. Thank you. So uh, I think like so many others, I had the great good fortune to be working on my research as I was doing my coursework. So I was focused at that time on, uh, on excuse me, um, pretrial, excuse me, uh, that's not right, on jury verdicts in rape trials, working with my chair who was Dr. Kelly Shaver. And because I was working on jury verdicts in particular, I had, uh, the opportunity to work with defense attorneys to learn how they used voir dire, jury selection, to identify the jurors who would be most favorable to their case. And this was the beginning of my interest in legal psychology, which is a specialization in the broader discipline of social psychology. From there, I earned my master's degree at William and Mary, and from there, you can drop down to the next one. I went to the University of Wisconsin at Madison, and there I was admitted to be part of the research team by uh, an individual who published the seminal research in the unreliability of eyewitness identification. So again, like so many of us who are admitted to be part of a research team. My early research was to work with uh, my chair on his research and gave me the great good fortune to publish a good deal of research on the unreliability of eyewitness identification. Uh, there again, I was able to work with, um, with attorneys uh, to I worked with defense attorneys in particular, where uh, they invited me to participate in jury trials, excuse me, yes, jury trials, as an expert witness testifying on the, uh, the uh, unreliability of eyewitness identification, where the state's case depended on the reliability of eyewitness identification. I mean, most, most people probably don't realize that eyewitness identification is much less reliable than polygraph, for example, but eyewitness identification is what so many jurors expect to hear in, uh, at, at trial. So my doctoral work now clearly focused on psychology and law. And like my chair who had a joint degree in law, JD, and a PhD in, in social psychology, I considered the possibility of pursuing a law degree once I had earned my PhD. But before I finished my PhD, I went to, the, uh, to Florida International University in Miami to uh, collect my data and to um, complete my dissertation. There, however, still within legal psychology, uh, my focus was on the impact of pretrial publicity on jury verdicts. And there, once again, no, no, no. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, you're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. That's right. Uh, I was working with uh, attorneys, learning how they used voir dire, jury selection, in this case, to identify jurors most favorable to their case, be they defense attorneys or prosecutors. 
Uh, to that end, I ran focus groups to identify the jurors most favorable to their case. And in the process, and I'm sure that many of you uh, have realized this, even just watching television crime shows, that the success, uh, the attorney's success is contingent on their uh, skills at persuasion. Uh, so I took that information with me to uh, where I was considering next, and I was deciding whether or not I wanted to actually pursue a degree in law, but at, the, at that time, having just earned my PhD in social psychology with a specialization in legal psychology, I was offered a position, a tenured position at, in the psychology department at the uh, University of Portsmouth in England. And at this time, given that there were uh, budget crunches in higher ed all across the country. I jumped at the opportunity to go overseas. And this was a very interesting experience because here, my program of research morphed yet again. And now I was looking at was what was a particular interest to social psychologists uh, at the time, which was the impact of violent media on, in this case, attitudes toward women, particularly the idea that the consumption of violent media tends to des desensitize violent media consumers such that they are less sympathetic to victims of violence. As I was about to launch my program of research, I was informed by the government, by U the UK government that my research would not be permitted on grounds that in the UK at that time, ordinary citizens did not have access to violent media. Um, their media consumption was of pretty anodyne uh, options, but that all changed, fortunate for me, right when I was there, because now the UK had the import of the all-American action film which we know is extremely violent. So I worked with uh, the UK Human Research Protection Board, which is equivalent to a university IRB here in the States. And uh, they were working with me, were able to expand and refine their policies such that the ethical, um, the ethical rules for uh, doing research with human subjects changed to allow me to continue my program of research. While I was still in the UK, and we can go on to the next one, I was again invited to uh, join the sociology department at the University of Northern Colorado on grounds that uh, and this is something that maybe that a lot of individuals aren't aware of, but social psychology is an area of research that is studied both by sociology and uh, psychology, but from very, very different perspectives. And so the sociology department at the University of Northern Colorado wanted me uh, to join their department in order to increase and expand their offerings to include social psychology from a specifically social, uh, uh, from a psychological perspective. That was a learning experience for me. Um, and I loved it there and I stayed <laughs> at it and was a tenured, a tenured professor. Uh, I was there for 19.5 years. When I retired, I had the opportunity to join Walden. And after my sometimes very uh, circuitous path, I decided that after all, what I really wanted was to be an academic. And I really wanted to work with students. In particular, I wanted to work with students doing their research. Uh, this is the opportunity that Walden afforded me and 12 years ago, I joined with Walden 
And I have been here since and intend, intend to remain. So um, the options that I had along the way uh, were numerous and I considered each one of them. And I should add too, that many of my colleagues who earn degrees in social psychology, who earn PhDs in social psychology, even as they are academics in a university situation, are, spend a lot of time consulting because our expert testimony in areas where we are expert uh, is of tremendous value to the criminal justice system. In particular, we work primarily for defense attorneys. And um, it's, I might add, extremely lucrative. So something to consider for individuals who are finding social psychology fascinating uh, as it is and wish to pursue that particular degree. One does not need to stick with academics, although one can be an academic and do this kind of consulting uh, uh, simultaneously. So thank you very much. And now I turn it over to Dr. J. Dill. Thank you, Dr. Dexter. Uh, and as you can see, the broad scope is in a uh, appropriate uh, phrase to use in social psychology because the road winds in ways you never know. And in my two winding ways, I've got one sort of professional way and then one that's truly far afield. You just, you never know how far afield it's going to be when you apply the preparation and the training that you've got in such an applicable field to, as social psychology to any of your diverse life interests. And so my two, as you see with the bullet points here, is through uh, some experience in motivational theory where we used psychophysiological indices of motivational arousal like blood pressure, galvanic skin response, heart rate, and then later moving on to neurological indices of certain other social psych broadly defined kinds of um, research areas, I was able to um, uh, an idea just hit as uh, studying the neural correlates of meditation and then finding a, uh, um, a modulation technique that you can up and um, down the, the frequency of, of activity along neurons of activation patterns called transcranial magnetic stimulation. And so these two ideas came together and I thought, well, if we know sort of what's going on in the brain when you meditate, what's heightened in its arousal, what's deafferented in its, you know, its arousal, and then maybe you could use this technique of transcranial magnetic stimulation to modulate selective brain areas and, and then just pitch that idea to uh, the, uni the Medical University of South Carolina, who, who's one of the top, um, along with uh, Harvard, one of the top TMS um, research teams. And so I'll have a slide for that in just a second. And the other one was just applying a familiarity with psychological phenomena, cultural issues, environmental effects, along with some personality stuff. I was a fan of a, of a television show and um, Star Trek. And, and it just happened that maybe we could implement some of these um, psychological dynamics into some character development and pitch an idea uh, to Paramount and see what happens. Um, and so did that as well. So if we could have the next slide, please. The, the first um, and more at home sort of, but still kind of out there, uh, opportunity that was made uh, available to me through my training was to do this, you know, affiliate with the lab. Here you see Mark George, uh, the leader of the lab, giving someone TMS. And so he's, he's there in, in this person's left frontal lobe. Looks like he might be applying it for a depression relief. So uh, in, in, the, in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex in the left hemisphere, you can enhance activity by setting the parameters of the device where it pulses your brain with magnetic uh, activity to up the activity. And when you do that to the left prefrontal cortex, it acts as a, an antidepressant. And it was this lab that helped um, the FDA approve um, that this lab was instrumental, not singular, but instrumental in helping um, collect the data that got FDA approval for the relief of depression. So now this is an accepted 
uh, treatment modality for depression. Now that's not social psychology, but again, this is a broad scope. You start somewhere and like Dr. Dexter, you, you move and you never know where that goes. Uh, and we wanted to see if it could be used as an adjunct to meditative practice. And we have found that it has not yet been able to do that, but we're still tentatively working on that potentially to see if we can find something in that. And the interests have also moved a bit of an fMRI uh, feedback um, to, to try to, to enhance meditative practice as well. So here's one example, some preparations uh, in research training, which is key to social psychology. Then you apply that to an interest in your readings and these pieces of the puzzle come together and then you, know, you have new friends at a new institution with whom you do research and it was fun. Can I have the next slide please? And this is my final and this was a truly, truly out there broad scope was uh, back in, in the 90s. Um, again, in the tradition, as you might see in the poster behind me, if you can see my um, little rectangle, um, the Star Wars stuff, um, that was essentially born out of Freudian theory. George Lucas worked with Joseph Campbell, who studied archetypes, a famous psychologist who was studying archetypes, pure characters. They don't exist, but the pure evil, the pure innocent, the pure rebel, the pure wise sage, uh, which was uh, work developed from Jung, who was Campbell's teacher, who uh, had Freud as a teacher. And so you might consider Darth Vader, Freud's great, great grandson in this tradition of um, using prototypes or archetypes, or at least some kind of psychological knowledge to develop a character that might then appeal to people even at unconscious levels. And so, um, you know, I, that, don't know how successful that was, you know, um, if it was an implicit thought or an explicit thought, but I tried to apply that. And I had some ideas for that show at the time. And as you can see on the, 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 um, the picture on the left uh, from Eric Stilwell there on Star Trek Letterhead, that was my first rejection letter of thank you very much, but no thank you, that idea was fine, but not for us. And so uh, took some more time to try to work and hone this, uh, particularly with some characters that might need more developing. And then finally got, you know, about a year later, the, the letter on the right, which was, you know, from Michael Piller, unfortunately deceased, an executive producer of the show, uh, saying, see, please come on out and come to Paramount and have a, a writer's staff meeting with us. And so for about a year and a half, me and a partner of mine were, uh, were, um, were story contributors and sent that thing in the middle, that picture, that writer's director guy, that thing at the time you could only get, it was a personal publication from Gene Roddenberry. And so but the point though is um, just uh, trying to apply character development, cultural, social, the, 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 um, the depth of dynamics that uh, a character should have instead of just, wouldn't it be cool if, you know, the character did this or some high concept sci-fi plot line. And I think that it was attributable to somewhat our success in getting on the, on the set of Paramount and becoming story contributors for about a year and a half. Uh, so you just, again, apply your preparation in ways uh, to stay active and you just never know. This could not have happened, but it happened to. And so um, fortune favors the prepared, I think. And so that's, that's my bit. And so um, I'll hand that over to Dr. Cosley. All right. Thank you very much. Um, so, you know, thank you all again for inviting me. Um, very, uh, very interesting, uh, you know, sort of directions that we're learning from from my colleagues, um, uh, Dr. Dexter and, and Dr. Dill. Um, and, and mine is, is another example of, you know, sort of the broad reach of, of social psychology and how it's led me uh, to a down a path I never, you know, anticipated when I first got started. So, you know, just real quick, um, you know, I've been a contrib contributing member, uh, faculty member at, at Walden since 2011. Um, uh, today, uh, I am a director of data science and artificial intelligence. Uh, and I also um, support a community uh, that builds um, sort of uh, support for education in data science and, and really helping people do what I did, which uh, is to take their foundations um, in behavioral sciences, uh, or other sciences uh, and leverage those to contribute to data science and all of the opportunities that it represents uh, in artificial intelligence and, and how that has impacted society and will continue to impact society uh, in the future. 
So uh, go ahead and move on to the next slide and we can um, uh, talk a little bit about how I, I got to where I am today. So um, I started uh, at San Francisco State uh, studying psychology. Um, I was uh, fortunate enough to begin working uh, with um, some faculty there that were interested in social psychology uh, as well as physiological psychology. We sort of worked on areas that were pure social, stereotype thread, and, and those kinds of issues uh, related to how stereotypes impact the way in which we perform. Uh, and then I was also working uh, on another uh, faculty's um, research related to uh, how social situ situations can stress our bodies and what that means for our ability to perform uh, in those situations. Um, uh, as a part of that, I also, during my time at San Francisco State, took on a couple of internships. So one of those was for a company uh, that was um, using neuroscience and ideas from the field of neuroscience, applying that to um, help uh, folks who had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease or who had been uh, diagnosed with dementia uh, to help sort of stave off some of the consequences of those diagnoses and prolong their sort of healthy life. Uh, and then I also worked at the uh, at University of California at San Francisco's Department of Psychiatry uh, on some related research um, associated with um, how stress affects genetic expression. Uh, so Moving from there, I got exposed to a lot of folks who um, eventually helped me sort of transition into graduate school. Um, graduate school was where I continued uh, at the University of Maine to study social, physiological, and neuroscience related topics. Uh, but while I was there, um, we got an institutional grant. And that institutional grant um, was really focused on cross collaboration. So that exposed me to forestry and business and economics. Um, if there's one thing that I think you can take away from this slide is that my education was really, I think, defined by access to a very broad scope uh, of, of various um, sort of influences in various academic um, empirical areas of study. And what that mean, meant for me was I was always looking for relationships across those very different areas. Um, and I became really good at finding a foundational set of skills that did apply across all of these different folks that I was working with and helping to solve problems uh, across all of these different areas. Um, after grad school, I uh, went, uh, I got a, a faculty position at the University of South Carolina, uh, Buford. And um, all, while I was on faculty there, um, I continued that sort of interest in the broad applications of the things that I had learned in my academic background uh, to real life problems. And so I started consulting with some local um, non-government organizations, uh, some uh, chambers of commerce, for example, and we started to build data solutions to help inform uh, their uh, strategic initiatives, their, their marketing efforts, all those sorts of things. Uh, next slide, please. So what really kind of led to my transition uh, was the constant sort of um, uh, opportunity for for me to continue to demonstrate how the core set of foundational um, I think we're having just a small technical difficulty. If you all would just give us one moment for that system to catch up. Apply across lots of turned my consulting into a bit. Thank you everyone for your patience. It looks like we are having just a technical difficulty, but do not worry. In Can fact, you hear me? Yes, yes, you are perfect time. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, apologize for that technical difficulty. But as I was mentioning, um, you know, I really, uh, I, I was learning a lot about how I could take all of the different areas of influence in my educational background uh, and start to focus them on really understanding how all of this information, the way in which we use data to make decisions, to build things, to solve problems, translated into some of the more real world applications that I was getting exposure to. I started to teach myself how to make that transition, uh, how the concepts that I was applying in the academic space would translate into the sort of 
business and industry space. And that's what really my primary day job, if you will. Um, and that's when I started at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee. Uh, I came into their predictive analytics team uh, with a strong understanding of both research methods and regression. Um, we started to build predictive models. Uh, we started to innovate uh, with additional data science tools. I started to really expand how that toolkit could be applied to, sol to solve a whole host of new problems. Uh, along the way, um, with my sort of keen interest in, in keeping up with my education, all of that sort of allowed me to build a stronger and stronger technical foundation. Um, and what really led me into the world of artificial intelligence was really identifying how all of those different influences come together. Uh, next slide, please. So how did all of this happen? It really happened with my strong foundations in data, in research methods and statistics, understanding that those fundamental skills could be applied across a variety of domains. But in addition to really also understanding that so many of the problems, maybe even all of the problems we face, whether they be in academia and basic research or they be in business and industry are human problems. And so I was able to translate my strong foundation in these technical areas, leveraging my understanding of human behavior to then build solutions that could solve those problems and do it effectively. And so I was extremely curious and still maintain that way to this day is to translate foundational skills into those business solutions by leveraging the very things that I learned as an academic for so many years. I had a lot of ambition to do that and I continue to today. And so with the skills, I learned the language and I really push today uh, to demonstrate how all of that comes together. Uh, and I haven't stopped or forgotten any of the things that I have learned foundationally. Uh, a lot of that still informs the way in which I look at the world today, the way in which I build solutions with those technical skills that I've acquired along the way. Uh, I don't know if I have another slide. Do I have one more slide? Yes. All right. So my, my last message to any of you interested uh, in that sort of broader reach of, of social psychology is really be creative. Um, social psychology sets a great foundation for us in a lot of ways, technical skills, research methods and statistics, but also behaviorally in terms of really thinking about human problems. All of the things that we deal with today, data in particular, are generated by people. And so we really have to have a strong foundation in psychology to be able to understand how to use that data responsibly and how to use that data to really solve human problems. And having a foundation in psychology is a real clear path forward to being able to do that. The way that I see it is, is that there are a few problems, but there are millions of possibilities for solving those problems. So we need creative people to be able to leverage their backgrounds, particularly in behavioral sciences, to be able to find creative ways to solve those problems. And this is one way in which I have chosen to do it in my career. So I thank you very much for your time, and I thank you very much for the opportunity to share my story. Uh, Dr. Dale, great story about Star Trek. I love that. Awesome, thank you. It looks like we have time for one quick question. And that question is, we can see through your presentations that there's potentially ample application for someone with social psychology training. What foundational skills do you feel social psychology training afforded you in applying the degree? And this is for all of you. Well, I might say uh, research methodology, statistical mm -hmm. analysis, answering questions in these structural ways, key, but also uh, theory uh, that applies broadly to the explanation, explanatory models of human um, behavior, thoughts, and feelings. And I would, I would, I would say what social psychology does to, to really just piggyback off of what Dr. Dill is saying is to bring those two things together, to bring that technical aspect to be able to use data and statistics to answer questions that are derived from our understanding or our supposed understanding of human behavior through theory and the research that has supported those theories. Social psychology drives us to bring those together. And that is fundamental uh, to the way in which I have been able to you know, sort of succeed and apply in a lot of different areas. Nothing more to add. <laughs> Awesome. What an amazing presentation. Thank you, all three of you, for your wonderful insight.
absolutely wonderful. And again, we wanna thank all of the attendees for joining us. We hope you take advantage of the opportunities to attend other academic events hosted by Walden. Please also watch your email for instructions on how to access the session recordings and be sure to complete the event survey. We look forward to hearing your feedback. Now you can return to the session catalog to join the next session. We have also included a direct link to that session catalog in the chat for everyone to access quickly. Thank you so much to our presenters and thank you attendees. See you in the next session.